me is that you understand and know God. Look at your neighbor for me. Tell the person, say, I understand and know my God. And in Daniel eleven thirty two, the word of God also says there, it says, those that know their God. Very, very clear statement. Those that know their God. As if to say he's classifying some people don't know their God. But those that know their God, it says the elements, the testimony of it are two things. Number one, they will be strong. And number two, they will do exploits. One area you should not be shut off is the knowledge of God's love. Somebody say, God loves me. You're not sure. It looks like you're thinking about it. Say it again. Say, God loves me. You see, the things of the spirit, they are word activated. Anything, every power in the realm of the spirits, they are not thought activated. You can be thinking God loves you. If you don't say it, it doesn't happen. So one more time, release the power in your words. Say, God loves me personally. I don't know why you're apologetic about it. Look at your neighbor and say, it's me he's talking about. God loves me personally. <laughs> Hello ladies and gentlemen, you're welcome to our Sunday special program, our Sunday anointing service. This is that day that the Lord has made and it's our responsibility to rejoice and be glad in it. How are you today? Help me ask your neighbor if you have one around you, how are you today? Ask your husband, ask your spouse, ask your friend, ask your child, how are you today? Remember, it's our responsibility to respond with rejoicing for the day that the Lord has made. I believe that this word that is coming to you today, the Bible says that God sent his word and he healed them. God's word will heal you today. Are you sick in body? I pray and prophesy under the power of God's spirit upon me and upon this meeting that the healing power and virtue of God comes to you in the name of Jesus Christ. To that person who feels a pain on his knee, kneecap, that, uh, that person who feels a pain in his thigh bone right inside, I speak by the Spirit of God healing on you now in the name of Jesus Christ. It is God's will that you are healed in the name of God. God is not punishing you for your sins. God has healed you. Glory to God. For that person who has pain right inside the depth of his left ear, I pronounce you healed by the power of God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, today we're going to start a new series. Recall that we just exhausted one speaking about the discovery of our purpose, generic and specific. And when we spoke about that, God gave us grants to make the month of July our month of purpose, power, and prosperity. I call it purpose, power, and prosperity. However, today God will have me speak on something I believe that is also very relevant and important to our generation. And we're talking about the knowledge of how to assess the will and the goodness of God. The knowledge and the um, experiencing of of the goodness of God, if you wish. Now, we'll start today's message, and I pray that as it comes to you, you can follow it sequentially, line upon line, precept upon precept, to take in the nourishment of what God's word has to say to you. It is not in the volume, but the value of what is taught that makes our lives better. Now, if you start today's scripture with Psalm 34, verse 8, the word of God says there, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Hallelujah. Essentially, it is God's nature and character to be good. God, the God of the Bible, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, the God of virtuous Christian Senna, the God of Alexander Farankojo is a very good God. And it's important to, from time to time, always remind us, retreat, you know, bring to our memory and reassurance that the God we serve is good. You may be going through a trivistar, a challenging situation, an adversity, a persecution. In all of these things, you must remember that the goodness of God is what will make you great. You realize that it is the goodness of God that brings salvation and repentance. So I, I believe that the Spirit of God has impressed my heart at this time to teach on the goodness of God. The goodness of God that wants to heal us. The goodness of God that wants to be kind to us. That wants to show us of his tender mercies. Day after day. Hallelujah. It's my prayer and prophecy that from this material time, you will be among those that will testify of the goodness of God. I prophesy that you are a candidate of God's goodness. You are a candidate of God's mercy. This shall be your testimony in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I rebuke everything that has been announcing challenges to you as though God has forgotten you. I come to remind you that God is not angry with you. God is happy with you. Hallelujah. The Lord God that we serve is not angry against you. 
Somebody might be there condemning himself and says, because of my sins that I'm suffering these things. No, the God we serve does not use wickedness to, to convict us. The Holy Spirit convinces us. He convicts us of our sins, but doesn't condemn us. Once we apologize, once we pray to him, he forgives us, and here we are ready to ride. I pray that the Lord will give you the fullness of the understanding of redemption once again in Jesus' name. So we are speaking and talking and ex examining the subject of the goodness of God. And you need to know it that the Bible tells us that God has been so good that he has shared his love abroad in our hearts. God has been so good, he has given of himself to us. He has shown himself so kind, so beautiful, how he has given us great and mighty precious promises that by this we can become partakers of the, the inheritance among the saints in light. He says that according as his divine power has given unto us all that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue. He says wherein he has given unto us great and exceeding precious promises that by this we can become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now what that scripture is saying to us is that God has given us so much that we can truly now partake in the divine nature. There is a nature of God that we are supposed to experience. And every day, a Christian can be carrying his Bible like a CRK student and not realize that he's supposed to explore what the goodness of God is. Why would we have such a good God and be suffering such bad wickedness? Why would we have such a good God with such good promises and be suffering very terrible challenges? At some point, you should query your knowledge of the God you serve and ask, where is his goodness? That's why the Bible says, not unto us, not unto us, O Lord, but unto thy name, that you shall show goodness to your people. The God that we serve is a good God. But if we do not know how to explore of his goodness, we keep testifying, the Lord is good, the Lord is good, God is faithful, God is faithful, with no practical proofs. If you don't understand his terms and conditions of evolving his goodness in your life, you will be just a, a regular Bible person who is just shouting, God is good for the reason for God is good. All right? But I'm inviting you today to a journey to understanding how that God is good. Hallelujah. How that we can assess that goodness of God. The Bible says in Philemon verse 6, it says that, that, that the communication of our faith might become effectual through the acknowledgement of every good thing. Hallelujah. That is in us in Christ Jesus. Every good thing. There are good things in us. Glory to God. And God is the one that has imparted us with such good testimonies. My prayer that as we have examined and evaluate these things, they'll be so clear to you, you will enjoy them. Let's start with number one. How do we assess the goodness of God? How do we taste and see that the Lord is good? In the scriptures, 1 Timothy chapter 2, let's go there. I want you to know that God is a good God to you. And he wants you to enjoy of his goodness. Enjoy of his goodness. Hallelujah. Let's start first of all today with 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. It says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest were a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith, have made a shipwreck. I like to refer to the scripture almost always. One of my reasons is because it gives us clarity that there are things to emboldify faith. There are things that embolden our faith. And one of them is a good conscience. And that's the first thing I want to speak about today, about how to assess the goodness of our God. The first of it is purity. You must understand that purity is the beginning of any transaction with God. Well, now, in the New Testament context, I would say righteousness. But I don't want to leave it just at righteousness. I want to use the word purity deliberately. Of course, righteousness encapsulates all of the other factors of righteousness, which includes holiness, which includes purity, which includes other things. But I'm speaking specifically today about keeping a pure heart, a pure conscience, purity of heart, purity of spirit, purity of body. Glory to God. I think in our generation, especially in this disposition where we emphasize that God loves us in turn, we seem to somewhere have relegated the importance of this Christian virtue called purity. I'm talking about purity of hearts. The word of God says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 3, it says, Let him that hath this hope in him purify himself just as he is pure. In other words, if you have any Christian hope in your spirit, purity of heart. The Bible says, Blessed are the pure in heart, 
for they shall see God. In other words, if you want to see God, not seeing God physically with your optical eyes, but seeing God in terms of God being manifested in a tangible sense in your life. To experience that level of God's goodness, it begins with purity. The Bible says, nevertheless, the foundation of the Lord standeth short. Sure. 2 Timothy chapter 2. It says, having this seal upon him, let him that name the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. I want to say it categorically that as a New Testament Christian, one of the things you should delight in is your appetite for righteousness. The word of God says in Psalm 45 verse 7, it says, because thou lovest righteousness and hated wickedness. In other words, to the degree to which you love righteousness and disregard iniquity, therefore the Lord thy God will exalt you, has exalted you and will exalt you above your fellows. I want to state categorically that God has great pleasure when we keep a pure heart. Not just a pure heart towards him alone, but a pure conscience even towards our fellow men. The beginning of any conversation with God starts with the purity. If you remember in Matthew chapter 5 and in Matthew chapter 25, the Bible says that if you come with a prayer and you have a gift in your hand for God, it says when it is time to render that gift, you must stop to check if that person you are, I mean, if you have anybody that has a heart against you, what that means is that you should take a, 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 an inventory. You should take an emotional check on your emotions and ask yourself, is that, am I in offense towards anybody? The Bible says that of, of fulfilled love, fulfilled the law. In other words, you have, uh, you have encapsulated everything the law has to say when we do the actions of love. So I'm speaking essentially, first of all, about purity. Whether you have an experience and you purify yourself. You don't just let your life go on as if it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. No, you must walk with purity of heart. The Bible talks about how that when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. The Bible speaks about how that uh, the blood of Jesus Christ purges us of uh, our conscience from dead works that we might serve the living God. In, in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. So you must understand the role purity plays in your life. Don't carry a defiled conscience. Acts 24, 16. He says that, therefore I exercise myself to ensure that I walk in a pure conscience towards God and towards man. So you must walk with conscience that is true. A heart that is pure. A conversation that inside, outside is void of exaggerations. You have the right proportion of truth in your spirit. Anyone who does not have an appetite to interact with truth is not yet ready to interact with the God that is true. I want to invite you today to a conversation. The Bible says, if you have any kind of hope in you, let it be that you carry a measure of purity, a sincerity of heart, a sincerity of purpose, a purity of conscience. Glory to God. And let nobody talk about perfection here. I'm not talking about perfection. I'm saying whatever the circumstance, you understand the role the blood of Jesus Christ pay, plays in your success in relating to God. So we're speaking about the, the accessing the goodness of God. Positioning yourself for God's best. Hallelujah. But then it must start with your conversations with truth. And the truth of the matter is that you should embrace the purity of God's spirit. That's why it's called Holy Spirit. The Bible says that let us therefore follow peace with all men and seek holiness. It says, for without which no man shall see the Lord. There is a role, I believe, that a sincere Christian must play in carrying a true conscience towards his maker and towards humanity. I'm praying for you today that everywhere where the enemy has taken advantage of you or gained advantage over you, in the sign sense that your conscience has not been pure as it were, the Lord will reverse such a situation and give you a testimony of the saints. So we're speaking about assessing the goodness of God. Don't forget, our opening text is Psalm 34, verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that puts his trust in him. So what are we saying? We're saying, how do we assess this goodness of God? I say it begins with that open heart of purity. The Bible says in Psalm 62, it says, If I cover my sin, the Lord shall not hear me. If I hide my iniquity, the Lord shall not hear me. He shall not, may God hear you in the name of Jesus. May God hear you, I said, in the name of Jesus Christ. So if you don't come with truth, in Isaiah chapter, um, chapter is it 59 there? He says that it's not that the hands of the Lord are too short to deliver. He says, but our iniquity have put us away from him. I want you to know that God has not changed towards sin. And I'm not talking about the sin of, um, that was um, bequeathed upon Christ Jesus. I'm talking about actions, works of unrighteousness, uh, you know, infidelity, wrong compromise. It's important. The purer you are, the brighter you shine. 
The purer you are, the brighter you shine. The higher you love righteousness, the better your life. The deeper love you have, the higher your testimony. I'm praying that this conversation will inspire your appetite for God. Inspire your appetite for truth and press on to know God. Hallelujah. I say press on to know God. To know God in truth and in purity of heart. Ask the Lord to cleanse your soul, to cleanse your spirit and feel it. Not because we do not believe in the finished works of Christ, but it is important to place enough emphasis on the justified works of righteousness that we should live by. I pray that the Lord will grant us understanding in this. Because you are the child of God, you have his DNA in you, so sin shall not have dominion over you. You should therefore rise and live in the newness of life. You are no longer someone who is subject to captivity because you have risen above the condemnation of sin. I pray that the Lord will bless you in this insight and grant us good understanding in Jesus' name. I want to introduce the second subject, even though we will take it some more, is the subject of love. Love is the second um, way to assessing this thing called the goodness of God. Now, don't forget the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, it says that, it says, it says, God, it says, we love him because he first loved us. Hallelujah. He said, we love God because he first loved us. So if God has loved you, that love he bequeathed on you through Christ Jesus is an investment wherein he hopes to reap your love for him. When Jesus was on the surface of the earth, one of his disciples asked him and said, Master, which is the greatest of all commandments? Matthew 22, verse 36 and 37. He says the greatest of all commandments is that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your spine. Hallelujah. Loving God is a critical factor to enjoying the best of God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9 to 11, verse 2 to verse 12. It says, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has in store for them that love him. Hallelujah. So there's something that God has in store for those of us that love him. I am one of such people. Are you one? Come on, say that. Say, I am a lover of God. Anybody who loves God enjoys certain benefits. Now, don't forget, God loves everybody. But God was quick to also identify that there are certain people that show certain qualities that he loves differently. For example, in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 6, it says, For the Lord, and 7, it says, For the Lord loves cheerful givers. Hallelujah. Like I said, God loves cheerful anything. So while he loves everybody, he loves people that are cheerful at giving. God gives exceptional love to those that are excited in their generosity towards him. So God loves those who love him, so to speak. God is able to show himself strong to those who love him. He's able to show himself good to those who love him. Remember in Romans chapter 8 verse 28, the word of God says there, he says, and we know, hallelujah. Somebody say, we know. We know for a certainty, we are sure, glory to God, that all things, not some things, work together for the good of them that love God. Hallelujah. That love God. Don't remove that clause. Do you love God? Can you show it? Now, let me quickly state this. Anybody who knows anything in winning anything about love knows that love requires sacrifice. <laughs> sacrifice. Love requires sac it requires devotion. It requires commitment. How much of it do you show God? I know none of it is enough to get God's love or God's forgiveness, but it is important that you can demonstrate your love back in turn for God. Ah, uh ah. -uh. Think about it now. There's no way. <laughs> There is no way, I'm telling you, there is no way that God will see you love him and leave you, uh, you know, uh, obsolete or, or leave you des de de desolate. I want to challenge you today that your love for God should be responded to. You should show it. You should show it in devotion. You should show it in your commitment. You should show it in your generosity. You should show it in your service for him. It's not excess work. Don't be deceived. God rewards our labor of love. I, you see, the message that tells us that God loves us and makes us be quit our works and all of that is to help people realize that it's not in your workings that God will give you grace. God's grace is generous. However, the functionality of grace is dependent on your labor. How be it that Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15.10, he says, I am what I am by the grace of God. He said, yet not I by the grace of God that worketh in me. And he says, for I labored more than them all. Did you see that? He said, I so the grace was there, but he had to labor for the grace to count. So we are speaking about loving God and it is expressed in our stewardship, our sacrifice, our commitments. You know, the children of old for, um, in the book of Malachi, they, if you read the story, study God's word, or if you have any Bible history, read it up. For a long time, they were not faithful to God. Guess what? God had to speak up and say, ah, ah, 
if you guys say I'm your father, where is my honor? You know what they were doing? They will bring a goat that was blind, that had maybe one eye or one leg, that was shot, that could hardly bleed. And then they'll bring it and say, God, that's your own sacrifice. <laughs> Jokers. God said, you think you are clever. You think you are clever. God told them, he said, look, if I was your governor, can you give me that kind of goat? So God is saying, look, if you can't do it to a man, and you claim that you are, you see, I, I just feel that somehow, you know, those of us that have instructions and speak like prophets of God in our lives, we, we should hear this voice. I believe very strongly that God wants to show his goodness. Abba. You see, you can't be saying God is just good because you are praying, you are praying, you are praying. You are just desperate for it. Have you ever loved the Lord? You want God to treat you like the person that he loves, that without even asking, he knows what they want? Eh? That before they even ask, he answers. There are some of us that know it, that before we ask God, God is already answering us. Some of us, our story is that we have to ask 65 times before God answers once. But there are some, before we even, we, before we even call his name, he's already given us answers. May you enter that category. That category is the category of lovers. Hallelujah. When you love the Lord, God does not make any mistake with you. When you love the Lord, you have things that you don't see and interpret wrongly. When you love the Lord, you love his children. When you love the Lord, you love his work. When you love the Lord, you love his house. When you love the Lord, you give to his house. You give to his servants. You give to your parents. You give to the poor. You give to the projects. This is how love is demonstrated through giving. Hallelujah. And sacrifice. Not just in terms of giving of physical things, even giving your heart. Start with that. That's why the Bible says that if there first be a willing heart. So we are speaking about assessing the goodness of God. The goodness of God is there in the spirit, but to take it up in practical terms, the attitude of assessing it begins with purity and number two, the love for God and for humanity. I will take that part of humanity at the next session. Don't forget, the Bible says that a contrite heart, the Lord cannot resist. And I know that as you respond to this teaching, you begin to see God this Monday from tomorrow. As you start to pay the right respect to the things, you don't slander people, you don't libel people, you don't do things wrong, you don't carry mischief. You do the right things and practice righteousness, as it were, because you are righteous. So if you are righteous, practice it. When we know your practice will not make you righteous, but your practice confirms you are righteous. You are not doing it to become righteous. You are doing it because you are righteous. You are doing right things because you are right. The Bible says that the word righteousness is right. You that word right is righteous. That's what the Bible says. And you need to embrace it that you have the life of God and the life of righteousness functionally in you today. I pray that the Lord will grant you understanding. I pray that this word will settle in your spirit. That you will receive with joy and gladness. And it will activate something in your spirit. A heart that is penchant. A penchant heart after God. A heart that is responsive to God. A heart that has great impetus in the things of the spirit. You can respond to God with some more. You can give to God with your heart. Listen, God doesn't want your hands if your hearts are not his. He wants you to give him your heart as well as your hands. The things in your hands. Because he's going to exchange not just his heart but it's going to exchange his hands to your own hands. I'm praying that this exchange of God's love for yours will be something that will satisfy your spirit. You will have true testimonies of the goodness of God in your lifetime. I pray that you will be part of those that will be a good example of a good example. I pray that the Lord will open your eyes to know what to do that is right from now. That your appetite for righteousness grows, your response to the things of the spirit is appropriate, and the name of the Lord is glorified in and around your life. I therefore want to commend you to God and the word of his grace, able to build you up and give you an inheritance among those that are sanctified. We'll continue this conversation next Sunday. I pray that you'll be blessed by it. Till then, please remain God's pride. I love you very sincerely. Thank you for listening. Amen. If you'd like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, please say the following prayers after me. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I receive you as my Lord and personal Savior. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. I receive the gift of the Holy Spirit into my life. Write my name in the book of life. Make me God's bride. Let me influence lives. Keep me rapturable to your glory. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' matchless name, amen.